possible cause of postcoital dysphoria (PCD), the prehistory and history of marriage, intimacy, and romantic relationships. The great majority of religions, if not all, have rigorous concepts about intimacy, romantic relationships, and marriage, with intense motivation to dictate that the only proper way of intimacy should take place under a formal commitment known as marriage. In the Bible, in Ephesians 5:5, it's mentioned the following: "For you know this, recognizing it for yourselves, that no sexually immoral person has any inheritance in the kingdom." Note that these are the words of Apostle Paul, not the word of Jesus. Despite of the consistent recommendations and standards from religions about sexuality, they rarely provide scientific fundamentals to sustain their doctrines about their moral code. Let's analyze some facts that can explain from a scientific standpoint. Using references of research made and the study of the history of human biology as foundations to recommend a healthier lifestyle in regard to romantic interactions. Today, science has identified postcoital dysphoria (PCD) to explain times of depression after intimacy. According to the Healthline.com, lapses of depression and anxiety. Are common after intercourse. This concept seems to corroborate the statistics showing the female population with higher levels of depression and unhappiness in comparison to males. After the start of their adolescence, associating depression with sexual activity, dating, and romantic relationships, which generally occurs after adolescence. Yes, there's strong evidence that dating, intimacy, and romantic interactions cause high depression, anxiety, and mental health issues in women. Now, let's see from the history of human evolution and biology what could be the cause of such a serious problem worldwide that associates sexual activity with depression. And what is diagnosed as postcoital dysphoria or postcoital tristesse? Ancestors of humans were animals that did not show the remarkable difference between the genders that we see today. For them, the pairing was similar to modern primates, wolves, and dolphins, in which females could defend themselves. But at some point in humans' evolution, differences between gender started to appear. In proportion to the increase of brain size, archaeologists estimate that brain size in our ancestors dramatically increased, being quadrupled in less than four million years, according to the Frontier article revised by the Drexel University. For many such brain size increase, it's an unnatural change or mutation that defies natural evolution. There's archaeological evidence that early humans and ancestors used brutal strengths to force females to pair in coital, making the procreation of human beings and hence our survival a product of the constant and consistent practice of series of rapes, generation after generation for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of years of evolution, making the sex practice as a couple an abusive, violent, terrifying. And traumatic practice. Such long-term behavioral cycle might develop a program in our DNA that associates intimacy with trauma, which might explain the postcoital dysphoria. There's a hypothesis that still needs research and strong evidence that this issue started to get attention by the very start of the first kinds of human civilizations, in which females were protected from sexual assaults. In a way in which intimacy was only allowed under supervision or in the presence of the group, such as orgies and sex parties, honoring the natural practice of coital in group, and allowing pairing as a couple strictly under a formal commitment known today as marriage. However, the lack of understanding of the purpose of marriage has distorted the actual value of such commitment. Making it a religious artifact of manipulation and control, 
in the last few thousand of years. In fact, according to the CNSR, France, the brain size of humans has started to decrease since the last 3,000 years attributed to the cultural delegation of intellectual autonomy to higher authorities, such as religions in regards to decision-making about personal life and family, what many call the matrix. The recommendation after evaluation supported by a number of scientific research makes group coital the safest way of intimacy and pairing in a couple as most appropriate for mature partners who want to spend a life together to form a family as a marriage. The bottom line, sexual intimacy is only appropriate in a supervised group or as a couple only for mature partners within a lifetime commitment such as marriage. The Gnostic Gospel of Philip mentions the sexual ritual carried out by Jesus known as the Holy Bridal Chamber. Christ came to heal the separation that was from the beginning and reunite the two, in order to give life to those who died through separation and unite them. A woman is united with her husband in the bridal chamber and will not be separated again. Safety always comes first. Below is a list of reasons to say that sex in a group is safer. 1. Supervision. Any kind of aggressiveness can be addressed quickly. 2. STD prevention. In orgies, preservatives are commonly available to ensure protection. 3. Reduce the probability of postcoital dysphoria. Restimulation of traumatic DNA programs can be avoided since not only two persons are involved as aggressor-victim relationship. Number four, emotionally convenient. Preventing attachment and emotional association to intimacy with one specific person, mitigating the development of false expectations and potential toxicity in the romantic relationship. The recommendation is that celibacy should be the best option, but if you really want to experience intimacy and a romance, intimacy should only be practiced in a supervised group or within the arrangement of marriage if you prefer a private couple romance. If you like our videos, please subscribe and enable the notification bell. And share to your friends, they will love it.